uh, for us to start. We're going to do something different. Welcome to New Day Fellowship, uh, where there's always something different going on. And welcome to all the people viewing at home. We're so glad you guys are joining us. And uh, today we're going to do our message discussion up front, and then we're going to uh, worship afterwards. So is that good? All right. Well, let's open in prayer, and then we'll dig into the Word of God. Father, thank you for all the great people that are here. And uh, what Judy was saying is everybody pitching in and doing their part, bringing food, helping us set up, just being part of this great work, Lord, that you've started here at New Day Fellowship. And, Lord, we know that as we uh, continue to work together and we continue to seek after you, Lord, and as we continue to reach out one by one, that you're going to grow this fellowship into something that, uh, Lord, is going to make a difference in the world. So, Father, we just pray that you send your spirit to be uh, in our midst here this morning, Lord. And I pray that all that we do is something that's pleasing to you, Lord, how we worship, how we um, uh, discuss, how we receive your word, Lord, how we love on one another. Lord, I just pray that uh, uh, today puts a smile on your face. And, Lord, we pray that as uh, your word is discussed here, that it goes out over uh, the Internet, social media, Lord, YouTube, everywhere. And, uh, Lord, we know that your word will not return void. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, turn over to Revelation chapter 1, guys. We started uh, last week with that. I'll just do a real quick, quick, quick review. As you remember, Jesus um, gave John a revelation to be shared with the seven churches of Asia. Um, and as part of that uh, revelation, as we're going to see today, um, Jesus was revealed in this incredible way to John and the churches. And the way that Jesus revealed himself to John and the churches in Revelation chapter 1 is in stark contrast to the way Jesus revealed himself on that very first Palm Sunday. And today's Palm Sunday. And as you remember, as Jesus rode into Jerusalem... He was the humble king riding on a donkey that was heading toward his death. And the image that we see of Jesus here in Revelation is completely different than that. And we're going to discuss why that is. So let's uh, begin by reading Revelation chapter 1. And we're going to look at verses 9 through 20 today. And then uh, next week is Easter, so we're going to take a little break from our study in Revelation. And then the next week, we're going to start looking at what Jesus said to the first church at Ephesus. All right. But for today, let's begin with verse 9. <clears throat> I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos, because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. And as you remember, John had been exiled to the prison island Patmos. And the only reason he was there is because he preached the gospel. And so the Roman emperor Domitian and the Roman authorities arrested him and exiled him to Patmos for sharing the gospel. But by the grace of God, the gospel was still going forth and this letter got out to the seven churches. On the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, Write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a gold sash around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all of its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, <clears throat> Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. 
The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. <clears throat> wow, what an absolutely incredible vision of Christ that he gave to John and the churches and to us <clears throat> here 2,000 years later. So let me ask you our first question for uh, today. What is significant about Jesus' appearance? What do you think this imagery was trying <clears throat> um, to convey to the churches? I mean, gosh, gosh, there's a lot of symbolism there in the way Jesus appeared in this revelation. Anybody have any ideas? <clears throat> Why Jesus appeared in that way? Power. Jerry? Power. Power? Yeah, definitely power. Any other ideas? <clears throat> Excuse me, guys, my voice is raspy. Well, let's break it down, okay? Because as you remember, this is the style of literature that's referred to as apocalyptic literature, so it's highly symbolic. So we've got to kind of interpret the symbolism here 2,000 years later. So let's take a look and see why Jesus appeared in this way to <clears throat> John and the churches. First, he said that, <clears throat> excuse me, guys, I'm going to get my voice back. He said that um, he walked among the lampstands in verse 12. Well, the lampstands, as we saw there in uh, verse 20, represented the churches. And so Jesus was saying to these seven churches, hey guys, regardless of what comes, and there is persecution coming upon you, is I walk among you. I'm with you. I'm in your midst. I'm by your side so you can take courage in that. You know, and uh, uh, I, I'm ever with you no matter what you may face. And, you know, that should bring us encouragement, too, knowing that Jesus walks among us. Um, he's literally in our midst, even <clears throat> as we sit here and talk uh, this morning. And he goes on, and it describes him as wearing um, a robe down to his feet and a golden sash. That was the kind of clothing that the, that the priests in the Old Testament wore. And so what this is doing is <clears throat> indicating to us that Jesus is our high priest. He is the one that serves God and serves us. And he did that by dying on the cross for our sins. And he lives to ever intercede for us, his church. <clears throat> and isn't that incredible to think that, that um, the Son of God, um, God incarnate, uh, came to serve you and I by dying on the cross for our sins. And that's how he was revealing himself to the church. He's saying, look... Guys, I'm your high priest. I'm the one that intercedes for you. I'm the one that died for you, uh, that your sins might be forgiven. And he says he had hair white like wool in verse 14. <clears throat> I'd like to say that I could sort of uh, relate to that, but even though what little I have left is turning gray, I don't have much there. So I don't think I could be described as having hair white like wool. But this is very um, important as far as what Jesus is trying to get across to the church. Is if you go into uh, Daniel chapter 7, verse 9, the very same description was used by Daniel to refer to God as the Ancient of Days. And so God appeared to Daniel way back in the Old Testament in the same way as Jesus did um, here to John hundreds and hundreds of years later. And so what do you think that tells us about Jesus? He's always there. He's, he's, always there. he's been around for a while. Yeah, yeah, he's been around for a while. Yeah. But what else? If the exact same description is used of God as the Ancient of Days as is used for Jesus, what's that tell you about Jesus? He is God. He is God, yeah. So the very same God that appeared to Daniel in chapter 7, verse 9, is the same God who's appearing to John on the island of Patmos. And it's just as God is the Ancient of Days, Jesus is the Ancient of Days. He always has been and he always will be. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. One God in three persons. Um, it's incredible how we see this throughout Scripture. But there was something else about the, the hair that's white like wool. In ancient times, that uh, indicated righteousness and wisdom. Because at least in the old days, the older you got, the wiser you got. I'm not sure if that's true these days. Um, 
But it definitely was in those days. Now, I know that it's true when it comes to Dave. Dave's got white hair, and he's pretty wise. So it still holds true for some of us. Now, for those of us who have lost all our hair, I don't know what that said. It might not indicate wisdom, but I think it does indicate stress. But, <laughs> so anyhow. Yeah, and then verse 14 says that he had eyes like blazing fire. Jesus was trying to tell his churches, he said, look, I'm the one that can see into your very heart and soul. I know your motives. I know why you do things. I know if your heart is pure or not. I know if you're holding to um, proper beliefs. I know if you're obeying my words. And um, I'm ready to judge if you're not. And so Jesus is saying, look, nothing can escape my gaze. I could have just imagined what it must have been like to see those burning eyes of fire looking straight at John. You know, knowing that Jesus could look straight into his soul and there was nothing there that was hidden. And he still does that today. He looks into the eyes of you and I who make up his church. And he sees deep down into our hearts and our souls. And he knows what's going on. He knows if there's sin there. He knows if there's purity there. He knows if there's righteousness there. He knows if we're obeying his word. He knows if we're fully committed to him or not. And nothing can escape uh, his gaze. And you know, in some ways that's kind of scary, but in some ways that can be pretty encouraging too. You know, because we don't have to put on airs. We don't have to put on false masks. You know, and try, try to pretend to be something we're not. God already knows what we really are. You know, so we might as well deal with it and let Him shine His light there and, and show us all the dark places, Misty. Mm -hmm. Then what did the two pictures that you showed us have to do with this? Because neither of them is the image that is portrayed right here. Yeah, well, I mean, we see God revealing Himself in various ways throughout the Scriptures. Um, and, of course, those were just artist renderings, you know, that give you some sense of the character of God. Um, but we do see throughout Scripture God as being the one who is high and lifted up and seated on um, his throne, um, sitting above the circle of the earth. I think it was Isaiah who said that. And then, of course, we know Jesus, when he walked the earth, he welcomed children unto himself and blessed them. So those were kind of artist renderings of the character of God. So are, is he drawn or painted in that because people would be scared if we painted him like this? Well, yeah, it could be, although if you go online, a lot of people have painted this image. Oh, okay. You know, yeah, okay. we see a lot of different artist renderings of this. But remember now, guys, this is a vision that Jesus gave John, and this isn't a literal uh, image of what Jesus looks like, but it's symbolic, again, of his character and how he deals with his churches and what he's going to do in the life of his churches and in the future uh, of the world. And so that's why, you know, we're given the task of studying God's word and understanding the symbolism um, so that we can understand what Jesus was trying to say to his churches and uh, to us. All right. So the next one, uh, verse 15, is it said he had um, feet like bronze. Glowing in a furnace. Wow, what's that mean? Was like Jesus' feet on fire? Or does he like have too, too uh, heavy socks on or what? You know? um, no, I mean what that stood for, and we see that same Im imagery of God also um, in the Old Testament, is that was referring to, to God's um, strength and power and ability to stand um, against all odds, his ability to stand against his enemies, and his willingness and ability to tread out his wrath upon his enemies. And so, I mean, you think about it, bronze metal that's been uh, refined in the fire is strong, you know, and it's immovable. And that's what Jesus was trying to get across to John is that, uh, that I am strong, I'm steadfast, um, I'm immovable, and I'm ready to tread out my wrath uh, against those who come against me. Verse 15 he says he had a voice like rushing waters. What do you think that tells us? He's calming. Okay, he's calming. Okay. Oh, it's also though, uh, I, I like you said that, thank you, Father. But at the same time, <coughs> down in 
Tucson, there, there is no rivers. I think I said that last week. But when the monsoons hit, the rivers become um, raging, raging waters. And the power behind them, nothing can stand in its way. Yeah, yeah exactly. So if you see it both ways, it's kind of a good comparison. It can be that calm, you can be that calm, relaxing by the stream. But you can also sit in the monsoons and yeah. clear it out. Yeah. Anybody? Or, yes, George. Was there, there wasn't anybody there but John to see this, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just John. Yeah, this he was, was in the done. spirit on the Lord's Day, which means he was sort of um, in, in a different state of mind where he was in really close contact with the Lord, and then Jesus gave him this revelation and revealed himself to him. So he was the only one there. This whole thing was for his. But then to be shared with right. the churches. Right. Yeah, yeah exactly. Anybody in here like to hike by waterfalls? Yeah, I love it. And I don't know if, if you guys have ever been by a big waterfall before or not, but, but uh, Colleen and I used to like, or like to uh, hike in the uh, Smoky Mountains down in Gatlinburg. And you can come across some really big waterfalls there. And I mean, it, it's really such a cool sound, but it's also this sound of, like Judy said, it's also a sound of power. You know, rushing waters. And you guys know the power that water has. Uh, I mean, we produce energy with rushing water. And so I think the, the, uh, the emphasis here is his voice was like rushing water, which means you can't not hear it, and you better listen up to what I've got to say. You know, it wasn't this little trickle, <laughs> you know, but it was like this raging river going over a waterfall where it was probably for John almost deafening, but he could still hear the words. And I think for the churches, it was like, hey, churches, what I've got to say here in the next couple of minutes, you know, as we get into the individual letters to the churches, you better listen to what I've got to say. All right, because I'm, I'm not playing around. I want you to hear what I've got to say. I've got words of encouragement for you, sounds of peace, like Colleen said, but I've also got words of warning for you. So Jesus wasn't, you know, playing around. He wasn't whispering kind of like he did to um, Elijah, but he was, he was saying, listen up. Because you remember, at the end of every letter to the churches, and we'll see this as we go along, Jesus always said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So he's saying, listen up. And Jesus was saying in a way where they, people couldn't say, oh, I just didn't hear what you had to say, Jesus. He's like, no, my voice is like mighty waters. It, for me, it's kind of symbolic also of, you know, like when you're hiking and you can hear the waterfall in the distance. So if you're viewing that as your relationship with God, the closer you get, not only does his voice get louder, but when you're right by that waterfall, it drowns out everything else. Yeah. So the closer you are to God, the less likely those outward things are interrupting you yeah. because you're listening straight to him. There was a I'll show you guys, I, I like sci-fi movies, all right? And, and you guys remember the movies out here a couple of years ago called The Quiet Place? And it was like the aliens, and they could pick up on sound. And so the dad took his son, and they sat right next to a waterfall. And they could talk to each other because they were real close, but the, the <coughs> rushing waters drowned out the sound of their voices so the aliens couldn't hear them and track them down. You guys are looking at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> Check out the movie. It's good. It's clean and it's a good, exciting sci-fi movie. But anyway, that's kind of movie sci-fi. Like. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I'm an alien. Well, we are aliens and strangers in the world, right? The Bible says, yeah. So, all right, verse 16. Um, Jesus said, I hold the seven stars. And he told us what the seven stars were there in verse 20. And he says, that's the angels of the seven churches. Now, you got to remember that this is symbol a symbolic book. So, Jesus wasn't referring to literal heavenly host here, but the word angel literally means messenger. All right? So, he, was, um, he holds the messengers, uh, or the messengers of the seven churches in his hands. And if you want to look down real quick at uh, chapter 2, verse 1, he says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write. Well, John wasn't going to send a letter to one of the heavenly hosts. He was sending a letter to the messenger of the churches. 
And the messengers of the churches would have been either the pastors or the leaders of the churches. And so John was supposed to send this revelation to the messengers because the word angel just is from the Greek word angelos, which means messenger. Sometimes it refers to the heavenly host, what we think of as angels, you know, spirit beings. Uh, but sometimes it just refers to somebody who has a message. All right, so Jesus said, look, I'm holding in my hand the messengers or the pastors or the leaders of the churches. All right, so he not only walks among us, but he holds us in his hand. And I know for me as a leader in the church, and some of you are leaders in our church here, that should give us great encouragement knowing that Jesus holds us in his hand. You know, I mean, there's great security great protection um, knowing that Jesus holds us in his hand. But there's also something else, though, that that tells me, is there's also great accountability for church leaders. I mean, he's holding us in his hand, so he's like, okay, I'm here for you, I'm, I'm protecting you, I'm with you, but also because I've put you in a place of leadership, there's great accountability. You answer to me, so you better make sure you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. You know, so there's encouragement there, but there's also, I think, um, somewhat of a sort of a heads up to church leaders that we better do what we're supposed to be doing. And as we see, as we go through the seven letters to the churches, there's a lot of church leaders who weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing. You know, they, they, <laughs> they had this vision of Jesus, but they didn't take it very seriously. Um, Double-edged sword. Verse 16, in his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp, double-edged sword. Well, come on, we know literally Jesus doesn't have a sword sticking out of his mouth. That'd be kind of freaky, wouldn't it? You know, but again, symbolism. Remember, this is apocalyptic literature. So what do you think the sword that comes out of Jesus' mouth represents? And it's a double-edged sword to give you a hint. Yeah, the Word of God. Remember, Paul described the Word of God as a two-edged sword, remember? Yeah, so it's, it talks that Jesus, what he's revealing to the churches here, is the Word of God. So again, it's like, we better listen up, because this is the Word of Almighty God, the Ancient of Days, to the churches. And not just to the seven churches of Asia back there in the first century, around 95 AD, but for us right now, here in 2022. You know, we're still the church uh, of the Lord. And so he's speaking to us as just as he was speaking um, to them. And because it's the word of God, uh, we better take heed. But there's something else about the word of God. Not only does it reveal truth, not only does it um, um, have power and something we should heed, but it's also, Revelation 19, 15 says that it's by his word that he'll strike down the nations. So the word of God is powerful. You know, Jesus is going to speak, and that's how he's going to overthrow the nations that come against him at the end of the age. And so that same kind of power that will strike down the nations, God wants to speak into our lives in so many different ways. And then finally, it says his face was like the sun shining in all of its brilliance. That depicts his majesty and his glory and his divinity. Just imagine seeing just, I mean, imagine seeing Jesus and his face was just like as bright as the sun. And then think about how bright his eyes must have been that in the brilliance of that, that face that you could still see those burning, blazing eyes. What an incredible image, huh, uh, of Jesus. Yeah, Jerry? It, it reminds me of Moses when God walked through the side of the mountain and he told him, Yeah. Look, don't look at me. You know, he won't last. Right. When he came off the mountain, they had to put him in the tent. His yeah. face was shining. Yeah, he was too great. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. I never thought about that before. That some of that glory got on Moses, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, how do, how do you think John felt when he saw this revelation? When he saw this image of Jesus? I mean, this incredible thing. I mean, think 
Think about that image of Jesus, and then think about Jesus as the lowly king riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. Incredible contrast there, huh? But both revealing the character of Jesus. Two totally opposite ends of the spectrum, but still revealing the fullness of who Jesus is. So how do you think John felt when he saw that? He said he fell down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, look at verse 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. And John knew Jesus. Yeah, good point. Why would you be... That's like if I had a friend and I knew him. And then all of a sudden he showed up to me as like this. I wonder like, gee, what happened? <laughs> what happened to Leroy? <laughs> What happened to the guy that rode in on the donkey, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, they, they got it. John would have had a little bit of glimpse of this when he was on the Mount of Transfiguration. Remember when Jesus was uh, transfigured before them? Um, and, and some of his glory was revealed there, but now he's getting even a little bit more of a glimpse of it. But imagine this, guys. If seeing that vision was so overwhelming that John fell as though dead. Imagine what it's going to be like to literally stand in and see God in his full glory. Imagine what that's going to be like. Yeah? I, I have a little note here in my, in my Bible. So, uh, it says here, look at John 18, 6, because this, this verse here uh, of 17 and 18 where he fell down and, and Jesus kept saying, I am, I am, I am. Mm. And in John 18, 6, it says here, um, um, Jesus of Nazareth they replied, I am he, Jesus said, and Jesus the traitor was standing there with him. And when, Je when Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Oh, yeah. So it's a, it's a reminder of that power again, that if the soldiers fell back to the ground, and John who knew him, in some of his glory, and he too, with the power of I am, we have no oh, concept, no concept. No, no wonder he'll be able to strike down the nations yeah. with it. Yeah. Were you guys able to hear her? Remember when the soldiers came into the garden to arrest Jesus to take him to the cross, and they asked him uh, who he was, and he said, I am. They said, are you Jesus? And, I, and he said, I am, which is the terminology that was used for God, how God revealed himself to Moses as the I am, and Jesus said, I am, saying, I'm God. And just that recognition, that word, those two words coming out, just knock the soldiers over. I mean, you want to talk about power. No wonder his word is depicted as a two-edged sword. And no wonder he'll be, he could speak the universe into existence. He could knock over soldiers with three letters, and he'll be able to strike down the nations that come against him by the power of his word. Wow, yeah, awesome. Um, <clears throat> I think, guys, one of the problems with the modern-day church is that we have lost the sense of awe of being in God's presence. You know, we come together on Sunday mornings or Wednesday nights or whenever it is, and we just kind of sit there in our seats, you know, and we listen to the pastor say something, and we go through the motions of singing, you know, a couple of songs, you know, or hearing a special, and then we're on our way. Man, we're in the presence of the Almighty. We're in the presence of this one who revealed himself to John to where John was just like, oh, I don't think I could stand up under it. And that was just a glimpse of God's glory. That wasn't even anywhere near his full glory. The church needs to get back to realizing whose presence we are in. And, and man, just letting ourselves be just immersed in who he is. You know, we got to start getting connected, guys. we got to start clearing our minds, quit thinking about what i got to do later on or the chores I have or i got to hurry up and get out of here and get to the restaurant or the buffet or whatever. <laughs> and, man, let yourself just enter into the presence of God because if you don't, you're missing so much. George. I agree with you. Thank you. I saw some things in our old, I shouldn't maybe talk about this. <clears throat> if you think I'm talking, you, talk, you tell me to stop. 
Well, let's, yeah, maybe since we're filming, maybe on 